Father William Costco. Welcome to the Homilist Podcast. Greetings, Jared. Blessed to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Man, I appreciate you coming on. We were uh, we were in a we were in a good conversation just before we got rolling here, and, and I thought, Dad, come on, I don't want anybody to miss this. This is really this is really good. So we're going to jump right back into where we were. Um, we'll tell you more about this this gal that uh, my my daughter's friend. She's telling me about the vestments and like this is what the vestments are for. Like you put it on so that the preacher disappears. And the word of God just becomes the word of God. And it's not distracting and it's not do, being distracted from because of whatever and it was. It was just, it was great. I mean, it was absolutely yeah. great. I was like, this is, this is good. This is really good. So, yeah, we don't want to in the Catholic church so much, you know, just make our priests unimportant where it's sure. like, uh, Hey, one's the same as the next. And uh, we don't want them to have personalities and such, but uh, cause people need good preaching. They need people they can connect with. That's absolutely certain, but we've got to make sure that we know this isn't your show on Sunday. Right. And the priest has to go into it saying this, this, if you want to say show, this belongs to the church. Uh I won't, I won't choose the readings. They're already pre-chosen across planet earth. I mean, you can name a day in the future in the year 2880. (laughs) And I can tell you what the readings will be that day. Wow. Unless between now and then the church says, let's change the readings, but it's all pre-planned in that sense. Uh, and so, and so uh, the priest has to fit himself into a, a universal uh, presentation of the gospel and of the faith and of the sacrifice of Christ. And so you got to take that personality and sort of squeeze it in. Yeah. Uh, some guys don't like that. They want to yeah. break the mold and say, you know, but then they, uh, they, they can cause a little uh, confusion. Where it's like, is this the Catholic Church or is this Father Bob's church? Mm-hmm. And that's always it concerned me that that people uh, like the name of my parish is called Saint Henry, and when we work with young people uh, or young adults, I want to make sure you don't you're not a Saint Henryite mm-hmm. because it's very disappointing. They'll move to Kansas and they'll stop going to church. Oh, because you know I just go at my church at home. It's like. You gotta be kidding me. Yeah. You're in the Air Force in Alaska. There's a church nearby. Yeah. You know, just make sure you know you belong to a whole and not just to this community, although that community is important. Yeah. Which so. goes back to the conversation we were having a minute ago about, you know, the idea of if you only go for the priest, if you only go for the pastor, if you only go for the music, if you only go, and then you gave the illustration of these carabiners hooked on the side of, of a of a mountain mm-hmm. where they're nailed into these crevices. And it's like, what, what's holding you to the face and keeping yeah. you from falling to your dismal death is, well, the pastor, <laughs> you know? Well, I've been at a par- parishes where it was the music mm-hmm. and they put a little money into the music and the music's good. But the moment a priest closer to the guy's home paid him a dollar more, mm-hmm. he said, well, I'm going to leave this church and go to that church. All of a sudden people started leaving. It's like, man, uh, huh. <laughs> I mean, I'm glad you were here, but what, what connected you Yeah. and what, and how easily it would be to disconnect you. Yep. Yep. What was the, uh, there was, there used to be a guy <laughs> he used to say, look, if, if I can talk you into it, somebody else can talk you out of it. If I can talk you uh-huh. like, like, this is on you. Like you need to dig in, like it needs to belong to you. Like this is yeah. your, this is your commitment. This is your decision. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with a guy named Jordan Peterson. Are you familiar with? Uh, oh yeah, yeah, the Canadian. Uh, there you go. There you go. I was listening to his biblical series, which is it's a psychological biblical series. Like he's going through Genesis through, and I think he gets to like the Abrahamic story. And mm-hmm. at some point in there, he's talking about you know, <laughs> excuse me, in his own unique way of of saying you know, because your your bloody life is so you know, and he's going on his dark and you, you think they're so primitive and and then he stops and he's like <clears throat> when it comes to being primitive like don't look at these people like they were primitive these people in the bible that were primitive and he said they were making sacrifices and oh maybe you think to yourself like oh well, you have to kill an animal just to please god and it's like you need to think through this idea yeah how rich was their commitment to God. It was so rich that they had to take an animal and take its life. And that's how serious they were. How serious are you? And it was like, that's where I think, that's where I think 
a lot of Protestant churches have missed the boat when it comes to what I appreciate so much about the Catholic church is when you remove all the ritual and you remove all mm-hmm. the, all the rich, all the rich, um, all the symbolism art, that the, oh, yeah, the architecture, the symbolism the use of art, architecture, smoke, yep. uh, body movements, it, it, the senses, like the senses. I mean, well, I, I had a good friend uh, up in Oregon. Uh, he goes to an evangelical church and, and I'll go if a friend invites me. I'm like, sure. Right. I, I mean, in fact, I've often thought like when I retire, what I would love to do is go to different uh, Protestant, non-denominational, evangelical churches. I just want to observe and learn, you know, because many of them are huge. And I'm like, why does, what is the attraction here? And I want to learn from that. But I remember I went to his, it was pretty large. It was in Eastern Oregon. And afterwards he told me, and then we went to the Catholic church. I said, well, look, I'm Catholic. I'm still going to go to the Catholic church. And right. so I have friends like that. Uh, but he said, I would really like to kneel at some point oh, in our service. Man. Yeah. Because they had more of the auditorium. And we went out to coffee afterwards. And he just said, I wish there was a point where the pastor would just say, let us all kneel mm-hmm. instead of just stand. He goes, I want to, yeah. I want to get down on my knees and show my in a physical way my humility. So I, said, but, I, I said, but David, what would you kneel before? What are you kneeling before? You know, mm-hmm. but maybe it's good on its own. You know, as a Catholic, we'd say we are going to kneel before something. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so here's what's interesting when for, for a long time, our church operated uh, in, a, in a different building. We had, we had church services in, in a different building. When we moved into the building that we're currently in, um, it was a church, but and I don't remember what, maybe it was a, maybe it was a, I don't know, like it was Grace Baptist, but before that, maybe it was like a Lutheran church or I don't know, something like that. Right. There was a, there was a, <laughs> a padded kneeler at the front of the church where the stage mm-hmm. was that was that was built i mean covered in the same color of fabric the same wood grains and somebody within the church who was catholic before yeah had built this kneeler and moved it up to the front and so when we moved into this building it was like what is that like a like there was it was there was this confusion of what is it and somebody came in and they were like it's a kneeler, uh, so and so and so and so. They had this built because, like, that was such a rich part of where they come from and their history. And then when they moved here, they became whatever they became, you know, Lutheran or yeah. however they married into this family. Or that could have been the communion rail or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, but that was the, that was the. Th- I mean, it was just, it was really see, cool. Things like that that we've stripped the Catholic Church of, you know, since the '70s. I don't know if you know, you know there was a big council of all the bishops on planet earth, the Catholic bishops, something like 5,000 of them in Rome. It took several years and they felt that the, there needed to be some updating of our rituals. Hmm. And there, the argument was good that there did need to be some, but then after they agreed to some, it went out of control. Hmm. And we've gone through the last 50 years still wrestling with, do we need to bring this back? So certain things have been argued about like, Like if a person kneels when he or she's receiving communion, the Eucharist, you know, our belief in the presence of Jesus, Mm -hmm. you know, from the Last Supper, telling the apostles, do this. And we can read in the book of Acts and Paul's writings that when they gathered on the Lord's day and they broke bread. So it was in in some of the early Christian writings show, that's what they did. They always broke bread when they gathered on Sunday. But when we receive it, two things. If a person kneels down to receive it, Second, if they do it on their tongue instead of receiving in the hand, which since the 70s was allowed, and nothing wrong with it, but uh, if you were not Catholic, if you were a visitor stranger, what would those movements mean to you? Mm. Like being fed like a pelican or something, you know, like a bird, you know, like that would be weird. Someone would say, why? That, That strikes me as odd, but it would cause them to think, why? What are you trying to say here? Why are you kneeling? Why don't you just receive it? The person, the expression is, I mean, there's layers of it. The person saying, if I believe this is Jesus, I'm going to kneel before him. Wow. You know, uh, there's a philosophy called, uh, no, no, what's it called? Phenomenology. Mm -hmm. Uh, Phenomenology basically is studies the meaning behind uh, rituals and things. Uh, My philosophy teacher in Oregon said, uh, imagine aliens from outer space land. Mm -hmm. They see like a football game. All right. They're up in the top of the stadium. 
what would they report back to headquarters on, on the planet, you know, Zontar? Right. They would say there is this excitement when this brown ball moves this way and, and they would find meaning, but they would have to interpret the meaning and say, what is the meaning of this? Because they wouldn't know the game. Yeah. But they would be able to detect for the people this has meaning. Hmm. And then they might probe to find out what is that meaning? Just as if they see a man and a woman kiss. Why are these people putting their lips together? Mm -hmm. It doesn't, they're not sharing oxygen. They're not creating a baby. What is the meaning of this? Yeah. Why is it important to them? You know, why would they do it more than once? Why not just at the wedding and never again? <laughs> right. you know? And so it's that study of like, well, because certain things have meaning to us and we mm -hmm. need it occasionally. So That's one time's not enough or the way we do it. Yeah. So was that, so was a, a kneeler at communion? Was that, was that one of the things that was stripped away that was pulled out of the. In most churches. Yeah, absolutely. Now, because the argument then came like, well, we, why are we kneeling? Like a, a, a slave kneels, you know, God has lifted us up and we are his adopted children. And, and sure. Just the attitude of you are worthy because they thought maybe there was centuries of you are unworthy, you know, only the priest is worthy. And so many people didn't even go to communion. <laughs> maybe once a year, you know, I'm just not worthy. And they wanted to change that, but then they changed it and took some of the, the symbolism away to the point mm -hmm. where it, it just went the other direction. And we're, we're still working to try to get it somewhere right there where there's a meaning and there's a symbology and a beauty and an understanding. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Wow. I appreciate you diving into that. That's there's cool. There's wrestling. There's fights. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I mean, I bet there is. I bet there yeah. is. Not as much as there used to be, but there's there's some fresh ones now too. But it's good for us. Yeah. Well, it's good. It's good that it's good that we're at least aware of like things, things, things do change. And there's certain yeah. things that we do need to revisit. I mean, Hell. you can't you can't do that. You can't do that in your in your other relationships. I mean, there's people go through things. There's mm -hmm. things change. And when they, and when they do change, like you, I get to see a whole lot of couples. I get to see a whole lot of couples for premarital counseling mm -hmm. um, and, and some for marriage counseling. And the ones that are always in the most trouble are the ones who they set the rules and it's always been the rules. And this is the way it is. And it's like, so what's the problem? It's like, well, there's just no flexibility. There's just, no, and it's like, look, look, pal, um, uh, you're married to, you're married to a gal. All right. And, uh, and this gal specifically, she needs things to be able to kind of ebb and flow a little bit. And if this is always the rules and it's always dinner at five 30 and it's always this, and it's always that like after a little while, like, I mean, you're going to get, you're going to start getting a side of resentment with, uh, with your pork yeah. chop you know, every single, every single dinner, if you're not careful, you know, like there's going to be, you know, and vice versa. I mean, like he's, he's just, he's all over the, he can't, why can't he just stay, stay focused in that one area? I just want things to be, it's like, hold on a second. If you take the spirit out of it, if you take the yeah. spirit out of it and it can't move and it can't freely roam and you don't always exactly know where it's going, you might not like your life very much, you know? Yeah. And within church, within church life, I, I imagine for, for, for the Catholics, it's just the same. Well, there's, you know, you probably know a lot of those expressions, those little phrases about uh, marriage, you know, like men, women marry men thinking they can change them. Men marry women thinking they'll never change. Right. And uh, right. there's another one. Uh, uh, what, what's the one? Gosh, it slipped my mind here for a second. Uh Oh, that the person you marry is not necessarily the person you're going to spend the rest of your life with. There you go. Yeah. You've heard that one, I'm yep, sure. That's good. But these are these phrases that people can go, yeah, yeah, okay. But you can't teach it. Mm -hmm. You just have to mm -hmm. live it and then realize, oh, I'm going through this. Mm -hmm. She's not the same girl. Yeah. You know? And yep. gosh, marriage must be hard. <laughs> Man, I tell you what, there's days that it's, there's days that it's, it's wonderful. And there's days that it's absolutely, it's absolutely the, uh, but it's like, it's like anything It's like else. everything. It's the same with your job. It's the same with being a father. It's the same exactly with right. being a minister of a church. Exactly but I will, right. uh, I, I told a fellow the other day, uh, cause we were having an issue with something. I said, you know, the two things that break a pastor's heart 
from my point of view, one divorce in the church of couples, you know, that, you know, came together in the Lord. Mm -hmm. And I just feel like, I don't know what I got to offer you if we can't make that work. I mean, ultimately I don't have any other greater happiness for you uh, or wisdom if we can't get that essential ingredient that goes back to the garden of Eden to work. So it it breaks your heart when you see that. Uh, I said, number two is people fighting in the parish and it's usually Mm -hmm. about stupid things and most often about money. And I'm like, God, what's the point here? Yeah. I mean, you're fighting about who gets to take the food to the poor, uh, you know, the, the soup kitchen. Right. I mean, we almost had that. Right. Two groups. We take the food to the food kitchen. I'm like, who cares? I said, at this point, it's not worth doing. Just forget <laughs> it. I don't think God, he'll take care of the poor and feed them. He doesn't need you to. Oh, my God. <laughs> You know what? God will take care of the poor because he doesn't want you idiots around him. I promise you that. So you yeah. get yourself in line. <laughs> take care. Of, well, it's a, take care of yourselves before you bring your offering. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Yeah. Hey, uh, to connect with, you know, the theme of your podcast, some of the changes in the church certainly were to reemphasize since, you know, the 1970s. Uh, well, actually, the, this council I was speaking about is called Vatican II, took place from 63 to 65 like several dozen meetings of 5,000 bishops from all over the world. But one big emphasis was preaching, you know, get and getting in seminary where we trained to be priests, more emphasis on preaching because preaching had been sort of like, it doesn't matter. We're not here for the preaching. We're here for the Eucharist and for the prayer to God and to bend a knee. But they said, well, but we do need to instruct people and relate to them. And so there was a big movement. Of course, it's the, it's moving into the 70s now. We got to relate to the people a bit more and bring it to them. Uh, we changed the readings that we do on Sundays so that uh, they were people got a little bit more scripture, gave the minister more opportunities of what to choose from. Uh, so that was a change. So there was a bit more emphasis on the priest of, hey, we need you to preach a little bit better here. And I don't know if it was like, you know, competition with the Protestants and evangelicals and saying, hey, you got Billy Graham kicking butt here. And you guys are just going, well, let's all be good and don't sin and blah. You know, you got to reach these people somehow. So there has been that emphasis, definitely. Yeah. Well, I was wondering, that was, that was, that was one of the things I was going to ask you about. I was, I was going to ask you about, um, like, when it comes to the preaching, like, like the preaching portion of being a Catholic priest, Mm-hmm. What's the study? What's the, what's the, you guys take some pretty in-depth classes on, on oratory, on, on speech, on <laughs> homo, homiletics, like any of that? Yeah, there is, uh, I would say my training and it was more like a high school speech class. And before I became a priest, I was a high school English teacher. Mm-hmm. So I'll be, and I didn't go into the priest until I was 32. So I'm sitting there in the classes saying, man, I taught this before. I mean, mm-hmm. they were, they tried to help us like, you know, to develop our voice. But, you know, either, I, for me, it was like I had to get thrown out there to find my voice. Hmm. And it probably took me three months till I said, this is the way I preach. Uh, so, yeah, they do. But I think it's a, a combination of just your exposure to everything, whether they send you to mission work, uh, okay. whether you do pastoral ministry in a hospital or a prison, teach you theology, history. They're like, hey, all of that, from that, draw your voice. Hmm. And... But I do wish there were better homiletic classes. In fact, I'd love to teach at a seminary like a hom. I'm not saying I'm a great preacher, but we, I wish we would have studied great preachers, hmm. Protestant and Catholic, and analyzed their preaching and just say, folks, or folk, you know, future priests, this is how you reach people. Can you see how the guy's setting this up? And so I ended up developing this attitude that preaching was like being a baseball pitcher, and you have to have several pitches. Because if you always have the same pitch, you're going to get killed. I don't know if you know, uh, in 2001, the Arizona Diamondbacks, local team, won the World Series. They had this Korean uh, cleanup pitcher, the closer, you know, ninth inning. And he pitched a submarine pitch where the ball went under and then it rose up as it came towards the plate. And his name was Byung-Yung Kim. Byung-Yung Kim just wiped everybody out. I mean, the ball moved. You know, like if you don't know baseball well, like I don't know it that well, people go, that was a curveball. I'm like, I can't tell the difference. It's going so fast. Or they say, do you see that turn? I can't see it. But Byung Young Kim's, you could see it. It was like, how the heck? And he took care of them and got them into the World Series. 
But in game, I think it was game four of the World Series when he came in with the Diamondbacks leading in the ninth, the New York Yankees studied him so much that they figured him out. Mm. And they came from behind with like a home run by Derek Jeter and won game four. In game five, they brought him out again to close. Again, they were winning and they figured him out and they homered on him again. And this guy just was totally crushed that he only had that one pitch, that submarine mm -hmm. pitch. And it's the same thing with preaching. If you only have one pitch, the people get you figured out. They're sitting there in the pews going, oh, he's now going to mention this. I'll <laughs> bet you he mentioned some saints. Uh, we used to have a, there was a, a priest. He was a good priest, good guy, a monk up in Oregon. I studied at the Mount Angel Abbey. It's a Benedictine monastery. And they also teach guys how to be priests. Uh, but he always talked about a book he was reading, which wasn't bad, but every homily was, today I'm reading Dickens' Christmas Carol, or I'm now reading Mark Twain's Huck Finn, and 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 they were good homilies, but we always knew he was going to talk about a book he was reading. Right. Uh, and I, I think you got to have you got to have a curveball, you got to have a fastball, and so you you get them, they just don't know how to hit off of you. Yeah. And so you got to catch your people by surprise sometimes, yeah. including the thirty second homily. Now, I don't know if this would go over in a Protestant church, evangelical church, but because we have all the other parts of our worship, sure, sure, you can pull off a 30-second homily. I've done the quiet ones where I don't even talk. I just go, you know, stuff like that, and you walk away. Huh. And sometimes people are like, whoa. <laughs> and it's like, wow. that's all I got to say to you folks. You wow. Know? And we can get away with it. I'm not sure that someone in a you know, a stadium yeah, yeah, church yeah. of 10,000 people would put up with that. Yeah, right, right. I, I drove 45 minutes for this? Yeah, exactly. I mean, we quick. assume our people are coming back next week. And so you hit them high, hit them low. Right. And that's what I've developed. It's the baseball pitcher kind of thing. Yeah, no, that's great. That's great. And I and I agree with you. And any any great preacher, and any, and any great preacher that you study, uh, you will find that same kind of thing. You'll find that same kind of thing to where somebody will. And, and I mentioned him to you before when we spoke on the phone, um, a guy by the name of Fred Craddock, mm -hmm. um, who is a storytelling preacher. And you would, you would do, you would do really, really well um, to take a look at some of Fred Craddock's. Uh, okay. He's, he's, he passed, he passed away. I'm, oh man, I'm not even going to remember how long ago. It's probably been, oh, eight, 10, 12 years ago, passed okay. on. Uh, maybe he's maybe probably got stuff online. He's got, yeah, he's got stuff on. You'll find stuff on him everywhere. He's got books written. He's got, you can find YouTube videos. You can find, um, but yeah, he was, that's uh, what we need to do. We need to study these you know, preachers and mm -hmm. within our own denominations mm -hmm. outside. Yeah. Uh, because if it works, it's like, why does it work? Yeah. You know, how is this person connecting with the people? Yeah. Um, and you're talking about a, you're talking about a guy, Fred Craddock is a guy who he influenced like he influenced generation, like he's in, influenced generations of preaching. And the, the place you'll hear his name the most are, is in like, like preaching schools in, in mm -hmm. Christian schools. When you get into the homiletics, the, the advanced biblical preaching, the expository preaching classes, and he shows up, like he just shows up as this Fred Craddock's voice, because what Fred Craddock did with the story and with preaching was so incredibly unique because mm -hmm. I mean, I give, I give, let me give you an example. Um, one, one simple one. It was something like <laughs> there was a, there was a farmer walking home one day and uh, tripped and fell in a hole. And uh, he's down at the bottom of this hole and uh, some really kind folks came by and they saw him down in there and they heard him yelling for help. And they said, you know what? He probably fell in that hole because he was tired. We ought to build a bench right here by this hole. And then, uh, so they built a bench right there by that hole. Somebody else came along and they said, well, that's a really nice bench. And then you got a hole right here. Maybe the thing to do would be plant some flowers like around this hole so that nobody else will fall in the, somebody else came along and said, we should put up a sign that says, do not fall in this hole because obviously people are falling in this hole all the while the farmer is in this hole down here and then fred craddock comes along and he's got a very kind of a squeaky voice and he goes and uh then far too long um someone come along and they took their hand and stuck it down in a hole and pulled the farmer out and you know who that was of course you do 
He's the same one that extended his hand to you. And it's just, and then it's just like, it's over. And it's like, yeah. and he's just tying it into this. And you can think to yourself, I don't know about Catholic churches, but I assume so Protestant churches. Oh, we are so good at making sure that we set up rules around certain things and let's do It's like you help the guy, you know, but, but anyway, Craddock is so excellent at the storytelling aspect and what he does and the detail, you know, that it, it's phenomenal. It's absolutely phenomenal. So I would love to hear you. I would love to hear your preaching after you read yourself a Craddock book, because my guess is, um, my guess is you're going to be like, oh, I cannot, I've never thrown a knuckleball in my life. I'm going <laughs> to throw this one. This is going to yeah. be great. So, yeah. And that's the thing we need to learn that there's other pitches out there and other coaches. Yeah. I mean, pitchers are always finding some other, you know, oh, pitching yeah. coach that can say, yeah. look, why don't you move your fingers apart just a little more, right. just that little bit of finesse. And as you right. age too, you can't throw the same pitch, yeah. you know, you, you lose true, maybe true. energy mm-hmm. or experience. Uh, the experience of, uh, of running parishes, of the administrative work, uh, deaths of people, uh, maybe your own family, deaths of your parents and stuff. And you change from that or yeah. whatever you go through. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've seen, you know, we've, I, I know priests have gone through uh, you know, alcohol and drug abuse, and then they, they come out of that. Their preaching's different. Yeah. And you have to learn you know, how, to, how, to, how to adjust your preaching. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, that, which, which the preaching, this is this is exactly why this is exactly why um, I reached out to you um, when, <laughs> which I was just telling the story a moment ago, a buddy of mine called like, listen, if you're trying to get a hold of William Costco, uh, listen here, you're not going to catch him on social media. You're not going to catch him. You can't find him because you don't have it. Um, he doesn't have a smartphone. He's got a flip phone. And uh, if you want to reach out to him, you, it's not like he's got an email address published somewhere. Listen, I had to call St. Henry's and leave a message on an answering machine and hope that somebody was going to call me back. And he's like, really? And he's like, yeah. And I was like, so if you think you're going to go hear any of his stuff online, except for one sermon, well, you don't get to, you don't get to like, there's none. There's just the single sermon uh, online. That's all you get of his. Now he's got some other videos, but that's, that's it. Yeah. Which brings me to the reason I invited you to come and be on here is because of the sermon that uh, the sermon that just went absolutely viral yeah. um, that you preached. How long ago was that? That was February of 2021. So coming up on a year, coming up on a year, and millions a, and well, millions. It's really a surprise. I, my first degree is in filmmaking from Loyola University in Los Angeles. Cause it's coming out of high school. I wanted to be a filmmaker. I want to be a director or something to do with Hollywood. And what's weird now is, is years later, I just see the, uh, I see where that can creep in into ministry mm. and, and negatively affect it. Like I'm not a fan of, of, you know, we have some in our Catholic church of, of the TV screens all over the place. I understand if the auditorium is huge and people can't sure. see. So it makes a little bit of sense and stuff. It just is like, to me, those screens are invading and they're bringing this outside technology. Like people ask me, Father, do you mind if I follow along with the readings on my cell phone? Because, you know, we have these little booklets that, you know, we, I, try, I don't even provide them anymore. Uh, it's common in a Catholic church, you'll go in and well, there'll be these little booklets where you can read uh, and follow along with the scripture of the day. Mm. So we call them missalettes. All right. I, I stopped putting them out there because I said, the Bible belongs to you guys. You're coming in here saying, what's the reading today? I'm like, what do you mean? What's the reading today? These readings belong to you. You can find out. You can buy your own missalette. You should be praying them Saturday night, reading them, and then come to church I, I tell people, if you hear the scripture proclaimed from the pulpit in the Catholic Church for the first time, that's a problem. You should have already read it prior to the Mass, that morning with coffee, the evening before, and then you th- have your own thoughts. Then you go to the church and you see, you know, maybe the pastor will say something, you know, that speaks t- to you. And you're like, yeah, that makes sense. I was thinking the same thing. Yeah. But, uh, but now anyway, you're, because uh, so now you're an active now you're an active participant in what's going on. Yes, but we've denied the them this by That's saying, we'll take care of it for you. Yeah. I hate to say it, but in some ways we are almost communistic 
or socialistic. Yep. yep in our, yep. I agree, hundred percent. We will take care of everything for you. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, we call it a parish, all right, where the the church is, the office, and stuff, and and like we'll do everything. It's like whoa, 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 whoa. What do you mean we'll do everything? This is the house of God. This is the place where we have communal gathering. We have our funerals, our weddings. Uh, we do catechesis, Bible study, but that's nothing to prevent you from doing Bible study in your own home. Right. But if you think you can only get Jesus at this address, we've done you a great disservice. Man. And the fact that, you know, we don't encourage you to read the scripture before mass. So when people say, you know, like, can I read it on my cell phone and stuff? I'm like, I would rather you had the book. Get yourself a little book because the book doesn't also say, you have mail or don't forget your meeting or text. Mom, are you going to pick me up at four? I'm like, it's a distraction, people. The the technology, I'm not 100% opposed to it because I'm glad that there are a lot of people doing it. Mm -hmm. But I think we shouldn't have everybody doing it. Yeah. And I think with Corona, when that broke out, I think our bishops made a mistake. They said to guys, well, live stream all your masses. Well, that turns the priest back into a personality. Mm. Look, we already have masses that are videotaped every single Sunday that you can always get, corona or not. Usually they're for elderly people and stuff, but you can tune in during the coronaville times and stuff. (laughs) But if every pastor is doing it, now we're just congregationalists where it's like, no, I'm a St. Henryite now. I have to have Father Billy, Father William. I'm like, no, I didn't like that. So I just said, no, I don't want that. Plus, I don't want people watching it and saying, oh, look at that guy. He's cocky or that guy. Or if people saw my sermon thinking that I'm always screaming and stuff, I'm like, Mm -hmm. man, that was not my normal preaching. Yeah. And I don't want people saying, oh, that guy's, you know, some of the negative stuff that I, which you don't read. Like I I never read the comments. You know, I'm just, I told a friend, if there's anything in the comments I need to read, let me know. Because occasionally he said, hey, there's somebody famous trying to reach out to you and stuff. Or, hey, a friend of yours from high school is trying to reach out to you. But I said, I can't read that stuff. That's bad to be in your head. Yeah, absolutely. The negative and mm-hmm. the positive. You don't want that floating around in there. So, yeah, you're right. You're right. Both of those. Both of those. No. Yeah. yeah. yeah so I wasn't too. filming anything. Uh, but then uh, people said, hey, can you do something, some sort of messages? I said, fine, I'll do a few messages. I got bored with that. And I said, I'm going to do some skits, which were still little messages. And then after Joe Biden was inaugurated as president, and God bless him, but as a Catholic, it bothered me and it hurt me because uh, in a sense, he's bad for the brand. And it's like after, I mean, this is the result of 50, 60 years of the Catholic Church not catechizing well, that we would accept a Catholic president who would say you can kill a baby, that life does not begin at conception. It's like, but then we totally missed him. We totally didn't get to him. And whose fault is that? Mm. Who did not tell him? You know, Joe, you know, do your political stuff. Drop the morality stuff because you don't get it. All right. They could have gotten to him in the 70s when we had a little bit more authority and more respect. It's too late now. Mm. Totally too late now. And people have kowtowed. and, And I guess I was a little miffed. And I, I told this guy, I said, would you film my homily? Because I'm afraid I might say something that could get me in trouble. And if people report it to my bishop, I want to show him the homily mm-hmm. and say, Bishop, watch this and tell me if you think I did wrong. And that was the only intention. But then after the mass, people came up to me. I remember this big guy came up to me and he hugs me crying and just saying, you know, I've been waiting 30 years to hear that. And people are like, please, can you put it online? I want to send it to my sister. And I told this guy, I said, go ahead, put it online. I can't imagine more than 20 people would want to watch this. It's 30 minutes long. Well, <laughs> it, it, it went millions, here. millions. Really? Oh, in other countries, people said, hey, they've copied it in India. They, it's got yeah. 2 million views or something. I'm like, oh, my gosh. And then the letters, the emails, the calls, huge, yeah. famous people, politicians call. It was great. Yeah. Other priests, other Protestant ministers. Uh, so yeah, great. You have, so it was neat. It was neat to see, wow, we're part of a, you know. Yeah, you're not, you're, of- not, you're not by yourself. You're not by yourself out there, you know, upset about a thing that, like, I'm not upset. I'm not upset because he calls himself, because he's bad for your brand. You yeah. know, I'm, I'm upset at the fact that, like, 
I, I don't want I don't want him claiming any sort of allegiance with anybody that's yeah. over here where Jesus is. If this is the way we're going to operate, you know. Yeah, because if he if he was if he was not religious, I I wouldn't have spoken that way. Right. You know, past presidents. I'm like, eh, you know, it's too bad they don't believe a moral truth. Yeah. <laughs> but then when you say you're in the family and you are in the family. Yeah. And it's like now, I mean, the neighbor down the street, you know, yeah, I got a problem with the way he acts and takes care of his kids or his kids smoking or whatever. But when my kids are doing it now, I'm like, hey, you're in the family here. This is not the way we do things. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason I preached the way I did is I just wanted to make it clear to my people. I want to make it really clear for your protection. This is what we believe. If anything comes through this administration that is contrary to the church, don't you think for a second, because he's Catholic and the bishops don't say anything about him, that this is in line with what we believe. Yeah. This is going to tear you from the faith and don't serve your politics above your God or above your church. Mm -hmm. Gee whiz. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what? There was a couple of things. Most of the headlines or most of the, the little, uh, little tags on the video something mm -hmm. about Catholic priest and scathing message to Biden or Catholic priest on whatever it was like what, whatever right. these, and it, it was always kind of directed demolishes Biden or obliterate yeah. Biden or whatever it was. What was from, from talking to you a couple of times. Um, and, and if you listen to the message, like that, that wasn't the, that wasn't the goal. The goal was, the goal was not, I want to just burn Biden down. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Like you addressed everybody sitting at the table and the responsibilities of everybody sitting at the table. And you talked about this is because there have been certain people who have been silent for 50 years, Yeah, you know, yeah. or as a church, young people here do not become abortionists. I don't want you to understand this. I don't want you to feel this. You yeah, know, yeah. and you know what? Even us priests who should have been, you know, like like you did a good job of not letting anybody walk out of there and not feel a little bit of that on some level. You know, mm -hmm. it was a great one. It was a great one. I mean, and that's th that's that's the thing that caught my that really caught my caught my heart when I listened to it. But the thing that made me call and leave a message at St. Henry's, I told you this on the phone, was the use of the word apoplectic. <laughs> How many times have you heard that? <laughs> it comes off the tongue really well. Apoplectic. Yeah. <laughs> how many, how many times, how many times has people reached out to you and they've said, I love the use of the word apoplectic? Oh, several people have. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> yeah, I've gotten some letters from people who said the same thing. They just had said, I had to look that word up. That's right. That word mean? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm not even sure I used it properly. I think I did. <laughs> Yeah, I was just like, you know, why isn't there an outrage? But it doesn't have to be a mean outrage. It just has to be a, uh, we need to be firm about this. Mm -hmm. All right. And uh, and it should drive us a little bit nuts. But then there's also the other level that what's driving us nuts is when politics enter in, you know, they play a big part in our life and even maybe more so now than ever. I don't know why and stuff, because you can't put your hope in it. Right. You know, right now people are like, well, let's wait till November. I'm like, man, do you want to spend the next 11 months again talking about stuff and hearing this candidate saying she's the devil? Well, he's Lucifer. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, man, 11 more months of this crud. We're going to hear uh, it on ads and then everything. Yeah. So politics ain't the answer. But I had this phrase I made up. I said, it's not about Election Day. It's about Judgment Day. Mm. And when you go to the ballot, it really does matter. Can you put your faith in there? So, like, if somebody's going to advance the killing of children, no, can't vote for that guy. Yep. The next guy, if he says, oh, I'm pro-life, but for some reason you hate him or can't stand him, okay, fine. You don't have to vote for him. <clears throat> Is there a third-party candidate, someone who's not going to win, but who you morally could go to your judgment day saying, Lord, you know, it was Hitler, Stalin, and then this guy named Joe, all right? <laughs> yeah. And now I voted for Joe, and he did not win. But I sure didn't vote for Hitler or Stalin. Right. So go third party. Now, if the third party person's no good, then write in your mom. Write in Mickey Mouse. All right? I mean, don't just not vote because uh, somebody will vote for you, perhaps. So yeah. write in Mickey Mouse and get out of there. Move on to the next one. So I just am, like, surprised people can't bring their faith in there. Uh, 
Yeah, they, 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 and it, what it shows you is a little disappointment with the community. It's like, mm. I think your faith is in the kingdom now. You know, this is what I noticed. I, go to, I try to go to Europe a lot. I don't know if I'll ever go again, you know, with all the restrictions and sure. stuff. I've noticed that with the European Union, a lot of Europeans, their faith is in that European Union. It will resolve peace. It'll create friendship. Right. And they, they really believe in it as an institution of peace and justice. And uh, yeah, that's disheartening when people of faith have that attitude. Yeah. And it's like, look, we're going to do our best and we're going to try to create the best government we can wherever we go. But that's not going to solve our problems. Sure enough. You yeah, know. sure enough. Sure enough. Doesn't mean abandon the, the situation, but right. anyway, so yeah, that one went the way it was. You know, b- before I uh, preach, uh, I walk behind the altar. I bow my head quietly. My mom actually told me to say this. She said, uh, she said, just say, let Holy Spirit, let me be your voice. Mm. Say that quietly to yourself. Because actually, when I first, I got ordained a priest in the year 2000. And uh, I remember telling my mom, mom, I don't like it after mass when you're greeting people and people are like, oh, father, yeah, that was so great. Or what you said, I said, I honestly kind of don't like that. I mean, I'm glad they didn't say, hey, that stunk. Or that was boring. You suck. Yeah. <laughs> You know, they always told us in seminary, you'll never know. People will get something out of anything. You know, you'll say the word the, and on Monday, they'll be in your office. Father, the way you said the word the changed my whole heart. And so believe that. And I'm like, yeah, but, but I said, mom, I honestly don't like that because it's like, no, 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 not me. And she said, well, always tell people, I'm glad the Holy Spirit spoke to you. So deflect from yourself instead of saying, thank you. Right, you know, right. because she said, well, I'm glad the Holy Spirit. And then she told me the other one, I always, you know, say like, Holy Spirit, let me be your voice. Well, that Sunday back in February, I mean, I can only say now, okay, God wanted that out there. Because sure again, enough. we thought 25 people wanted to see it and then we'd shut it down. And then within hours, it was thousands. And we were like, what the heck's going on here? And so let the Holy Spirit take it, do what he wants with it. Mm-hmm. But I got to take care of my people. So there was a temptation to start filming every Sunday. Oh, I bet. And which has been the downfall of some ministers and some of priests since Corona, you know, they went online, got popular. And then, uh, you know, you, you're in charge of your people, Mm -hmm. you know, in wherever Ohio or Pennsylvania, you know, don't try to be a superstar. Yeah. If you're called to be a superstar, then go ahead and do that. You know, Mm -hmm. but don't do it at the expense of the congregation that needs you and needs to know you're preaching to us. That's right not to somebody in Los Angeles. Yeah, that's right. I mean, if you don't live in Los Angeles. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, it was fantastic. And, you know, even even on a um, homiletical structure delivery with that sermon, there were some <laughs> great things you were doing in that sermon. Not just, not just, <laughs> that's not to take away from that. Oh, and that part where you told the truth. I don't mean that. What I mean is <laughs> like, there were other things that you did that were really, really good. The refrain that you used about the snow. Yeah. And you, and you would, and you would toss that in every so it's brilliant. I mean, it's brilliant. I mean, that's one of those things. Some people can get away with doing that and, and doing that well, but it's got to be, it's got to be the perfect story. It's got to be the perfect line. You know, I mean, I have a dream is the quintessential refrain Mm -hmm. sermon. Like it's that what you did was good. It was good. And when you kept coming back to it, it was just like, Oh, well, I don't yeah. know what I call that pitch, but you know, where you tell something mm-hmm. in the beginning mm-hmm. and then sometimes it's book ending. Mm-hmm. You tell something here and then you go into what you want to talk about and you end with what you started with. And maybe it's called the bookend pitch or something mm-hmm. like that. Uh, maybe it's a curveball. who knows? Yeah. But and that story about what happened in Poland, I'd never preached about. I thought uh, there's no there's no you know there's no case where I would want to mention that on Sunday. It's a long story. It's a little violent and stuff. Uh, I had told some people no. I probably told them about it. You know my time when I was in the Peace Corps. But uh, I just said I think it's time to use that. It just mm-hmm. came over me when I was uh, you know meditating on what I was going to preach that Sunday. And I said, yeah, I'm going to tell that story. Yeah, okay, yeah. here we go. Yeah, it was excellent. It was excellent. It um, so let me jump to a, let me jump to a lighter, a lighter note for just a second. 
Yeah. Um, one of the questions that I like to ask, I like to ask guys is yeah, go through your questions, hit a, them. a passage, a passage of script. And I'm allowed to say pass too. <laughs> That's pass. Right. Okay. Pass. A passage of scripture, a passage of scripture that makes you laugh. Something that you've read Ooh. that you go. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I got it. Go on. It's, uh, all right. So I'm not the best at saying it's John, whatever. That's fine. But it's the part where Jesus says, let us go to Jerusalem. Thomas, Thomas speaks three times in the Gospels, and I think it's always in John, but he only speaks three times, and it's great that he's called the twin, because every time he speaks, he says the same things that you and I would say, because he's the student in the class. You remember in grade school or whatever, junior high, you'd have a question, but you'd like, if I ask this question, they're going to think I'm an idiot, uh -huh. all right? But there was this one guy in the classroom, okay, whose name was something like, you know, Coney, and Coney would go, uh, Mr. Saguaro, uh, is it true that? And you're like, dang, that was what I was going to ask. Oh, good. Let Coney ask it because, you know, he'll become the jerk or whatever. That's right. And then the teacher goes, Coney, that is the best question I've ever heard. And you're like, what? <laughs> I should have asked it. All right. But you're embarrassed to do it. But Thomas does it all three times. All right. The first time is uh, Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth and life. Uh, 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 where I'm going, you know the way. I think that's John 14. And Thomas goes, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Rabbi, teacher, <clears throat> uh, we don't know the way. <laughs> I'm not sure where you're going. And then Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And they're like, oh, God, I'm glad he raised his hands. The other 11 guys were like thinking the same thing. And then Thomas, of course, on Resurrection Sunday, I wouldn't believe. Because you and I probably would have said that. Like, no, come on, man. Yeah. If I it, Believing or seeing it, come on. I want seeing and so uh, he speaks for us. But the, the third time is in the middle there where Jesus says, let us now go to Jerusalem where the son of man will be handed over to the scribes and the Pharisees and he'll be killed. And, uh, and they're all thinking well, they hate us in Jerusalem and stuff. And then Thomas says, ah, oh, let's just go die with him. That's the line. Let's just go <laughs> die with him. That's funny. Yeah, that's yeah. good. That's good. Yeah. When you say when you say that it calls him the twin, uh, and, and maybe maybe this is kind of what you're alluding to, that idea, like within the Catholic Church, like don't you guys have, don't you guys kind of have a, an understanding of that when it says the twin, it's kind of like Thomas is our twin, like he's the, like yeah, he's sure, because I mean, that's the beauty of Scripture. Like, okay, he had a physical twin, all right, mm -hmm. or it, it also works that way too. So mm -hmm. it's both and, yeah. You know, we don't have to say, well, it's just this. It's like, hey, the symbology and the, yeah, you know yeah, how it works. Yeah, that's good. It's all in there. Yeah, that's Layers on that cake. That's right. But good. certainly, yeah, he speaks for us and in, yeah. in those occasions anyway. I'm wrestling, uh, I'm wrestling with, a, with a passage of scripture right now, Leviticus 10, uh, the, uh, the, the unauthorized fire, mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the sons of Aaron, the sons of Aaron, um, go to <laughs> go into the go into the tabernacle or into to, to to offer like offer some sort of sacrifice to god or or something mm -hmm. and i don't know exactly what it all means but this but it's unauthorized fire and like that's the problem and it's like so they go in and they've got their the little the, the they get this this uh uh what, what do they call it the sensors i think they call them the sensors yeah, sensor. yeah the sensor and so they're, they're bringing it in and and but, but it's like no one authorized that fire, you know, and it's uh -huh. kind of like <laughs> something that fire is unauthorized, but then fire breaks out and burns them up. <laughs> it's it's kind of like this. This fire is unauthorized. You want authorized fire? Let me show you some authorized fire. Like, here you go. Like, well, don't <laughs> don't step out of line again. Like, don't like this is the he just torches them, you know. Well, there's a lot of those passages, you know, where, you know, believers are criticized and usually from the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we have to do some, you know, teaching about that and, and say, you know, we are dealing with an ancient culture mm -hmm. and uh, we have to have some hermeneutic of understanding of, mm -hmm. you know, their time, their place and stuff. Like I asked my bishop once, the reading was about, uh, again, I can't remember exactly where, but about, you know, killing every man, woman and child when they, uh, you know, killed the, the Amorites or something. And I said, mm -hmm. Bishop, do you really think they killed everyone or are they the victors of the battle? You know, they said God told them to kill everyone. And that's one that we'll get pushed back on. Mm -hmm. Oh, your God said to kill all these women and babies and stuff. Uh, 
gosh, I think there's one of the Psalms that says, may the child of my enemy have his baby's head smashed against a rock. And uh-huh. ooh, that's a tough one. Uh-huh. Uh, but he said, uh, I said, what do you think? Or is that just, you know, the victor saying, well, since I won, God must have wanted us to do this. And he, <coughs> he said, Father Costco, they were a violent people. Mm-hmm. God worked with them still. Mm-hmm. And today we are still a violent people and God still works with us. Mm-hmm. You know, we want to be really careful about saying they should act the way we act now. Yeah. Right. Right. You know, yeah. applying our 21st century understanding <laughs> yeah. to a time like a thousand years ago. Well, you should have had a diplomatic convention. It's like, uh, they don't have diplomatic conventions in the year 900. Why couldn't, Your you, guys, gonna kill you. Why couldn't you guys have been more progressive? It's like progressive. Exactly. Like, do you know how progressive Leviticus was when it, when it, when like when those laws were instituted and all of a sudden it's like now women, now women can like do things and have a voice in something. Like, are you serious? Like, do you really like that was property? That was property like two years ago. Like, like when you're reading Leviticus, like all of a sudden it's like, well, for women, it goes like this. It's like they were property before that. Yeah. And now they can like they can actually like get a certificate of divorce. Like, are you right? Yeah, there's there's the protection there. That's right. I mean, it's like that's incredible. That's absolutely yeah. incredible, you know. So yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. Um if you don't another um, question. Yeah, well, here you go. Um, who inspires you? Comics, comedians, speakers, preachers, artists, musicians. Um, I did yeah. see over, uh, I did see over, uh, over quarantine, over, uh, over the COVID quarantine, you picked up the electric guitar for a little bit. Yeah. Uh, I've always liked music, you know, younger days, of course, like, you know, the Beatles or Rush was my favorite band in high school, the Canadian band, uh, people in, you know, in, in Hollywood and movies and stuff, you know, I've changed so much now where I don't really I mean, that's typical of our youth where we're going to look up to a, a quarterback, uh, an astronaut, someone big or something. And then, like most people, I've outgrown that. And I'm now wholly impressed by simple people. And it's usually people you encounter or perhaps read about. What, 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 it, what inspires me is the way people can show their faith. And... It can be in just incredibly small ways. Like, like I bury a guy's wife on Saturday morning and Sunday I see him at church. I mean, that inspires me. I'm like the grieving. I mean, like, how can you drag yourself in here? I would totally understand that you're just at home, just, you know, curled up or no energy for a while. That stuff blows me. Or the couple you marry on Saturday. And then Sunday, they're there at church. And I always point that out. I'm like, I just married that couple yesterday. And on the first day of their full day of their marriage, they're here in the house of God. You know, I said, I love that. And I love you guys for being here. Because I know most of you are probably off on a honeymoon or something or sleeping in because you're up late and stuff. Mm-hmm. But when I see, I'm like, yeah, the faith is alive. Yeah, yeah. That's, so that, that, that's what inspires me now is all those little things that I see and from my own parishioners and such, because yeah. you need it. Uh, yeah. You need to see that it really is there. Yeah. I mean, I'm trying to preach and you are too, to tell them like, you know, God's really here uh, or faith really is, is something real. But sometimes you're almost saying, please show me that it is. And that's true. And sometimes you got to admit, you know, that, that true. Uh, I think one of your other questions was about like, you know, how do we preach when we're struggling or that's something? Right. That's right. And there's certain things about that, like, you know, if we're misbehaving or something or struggling with something, it steals part of our voice. Sure enough. Because if we do end up preaching about things that we're not practicing and we move into the hypocrite, we're going to be out quick because you can't stand yourself. Right. You know, when you're saying I'm preaching this, uh, like we have deacons uh, and a deacon can be a married man. And I'm sure one of the struggles for them is their wife in the front pew. And maybe this is for any Protestant, married Protestant minister, evangelical minister, preaching something and the wife going, "Mm -hmm. (laughs) mm-hmm, yeah. Yeah, why don't you listen to your own words there? Oh, that's good. Yeah, Yeah. that's good. But we don't have that as celibate priests, but you should have that inner kind of, you know, tachometer saying, hey, 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 hey. Mm -hmm. You're moving into a territory where you're not really there. Yeah. So you can't preach on that until you get that resolved. 
And if it's not something like moral or a, or a sin, it could be like, I really don't understand this right now. I'm having a hard time understanding this. So I'm not going to fool you people. So I have to dial that down. Uh-huh. And uh, I have I to be it. honest because it once you start being dishonest, you're on your way out. Yeah. Yeah. And people can usually tell too, you know, sometimes I knew, heard of a priest who at some point after they read the, the <coughs> gospel, his homilies were almost exactly the same every week. He just kept saying, you heard the gospel, go live it. Hmm. That was it. And it, you know, not too long after that, he left the priesthood and they could tell he had nothing more to say, hmm. you know, because yeah. maybe he was struggling, you know, and wanted to get married or something. And at least his inner tachometer was saying, you got nothing to say. You're yeah. dealing with this yourself. Yeah, yeah. On the other hand, in dealing with things that are struggles, sometimes the best thing to do is to admit it to your people. There you go. Yeah. Yep. You know, my my when my oldest brother died in uh, 2017 in a motorcycle accident. Uh, I preached that next Sunday, prior to going to his funeral back east and stuff, and uh, I was very close to him, and I just told people, you know. And, and I said, and now I have to put my faith into action because I've done hundreds of funerals in 17 years of being a priest. Hmm. And I've never buried any. In fact, I've never been to a funeral of anyone I really knew. I mean, parishioners and such. In fact, I've never been to a funeral until I was a priest. I mean, I, if family members died, they died far away or we weren't close to them or such. And I'm like, and now it's real for me. Hmm. And I have to see if I'm going to you know, go into a depression. I got to find out if I'm going to be angry at God. And I was happily finding out that my faith was, it was clicking. Yeah. I was like, I can't argue with you, Lord. <laughs> like somebody else's brother can die, but not mine. All right. That why did God do it? It's like, there's no why it was an accident. Yeah. You know, there's no, yeah. I, I'm not thinking that way. And I don't sit there and, and you don't want to say things like it could have been worse. Could have been worse. Yeah. Well, then you're saying that there's people out there who got it worse off, but you're not doing anything to help them. Right. I mean, right. watch the way you think about that. Uh, no, I love that. I so love sometimes that. just being honest and letting people know this is what's going on in my life right now. Mm-hmm. Or if you're dealing with depression or even faith issues, maybe it's okay to say, mm-hmm. you know, I'm, I'm struggling with this thing in my faith right now. Yeah. People, yeah. Want, people want to know that, that you are talking to them, not you're reading out of a book. Right teaching them the rules and well, the church, especially with the church, because we do have codified writings that we could preach out of and say, well, we teach this and this is why. And St. Thomas Aquinas in the year 1100 taught this and okay, father, but do you believe this? Mm -hmm. Are you telling me this? Are you telling me this is what the church is telling me? Mm -hmm. And they really want to know that you're telling me, right? But that's, that's, you know, that, that could mean sometimes you tear up. Yeah, sure enough. You know, sure enough. Yeah. So you got to. There's. It has to be that honesty there when you when you're struggling in preaching, mm-hmm. or as, well, a, as a minister. Yeah. No. That's so. And I think that's. I mean, don't talk about your marriage. You know. <laughs> Stuff. I don't, well, you, you know, in our in our in our in our situation where we are, uh, we have a lot of young couples in our church. I mean, a lot of young couples, and mm-hmm. one of the things that one of the things that we have more conversations about than probably anything is marriage and so there yeah. will be times to where we will like i will stop what it is we're talking about and i will say men we need to address this issue and i will tell you firsthand i have experienced this and i am still experiencing this and we experienced this last week and, mm-hmm. and here's what i figured out and here's the mistake that i made here's the best scenario this is the only way to fix this and so let me begin she wanted to do some, she wanted to do some painting in the kitchen and I'm bad at sheetrock. Okay. So I had to patch the, and so then here comes, here comes this. And it's, and it's funny because those are the kind of things that end up in conversations later on around a lunch table to where we're mm-hmm. having a conversation with friends. We're sitting, we're eating dinner. And it's like, you know, I do the same exact thing. I hate that it makes me crazy. Or at the gym when we're, when we're, when we're working out, and yeah. another guy says, you know what, this like you, what you were talking about the other day, that is exactly where, exactly where I landed. And it's so that's a, that's a common thing, but I agree with you. And, and there's a lot of conversation about what level of transparency do you have in the pulpit or, or right. in your, in your sermons and that self, that self-disclosure, like the level of self-disclosure that, that you put out there. There has to be a degree of it. 
And yet, you know, people, they don't want to hear us talking about ourselves all the time. Nor should we. Correct. Yeah. But, you know, we should perhaps share a story or something. Yeah. You well, know? the part of the thing what that I have a kid in sixth grade, you know, sure you share that, that's you right. know, but don't right. overly gloat about it or something. Yeah. And yeah. Make it bigger than it is or something. I, I was actually worried in that viral homily, you know, sharing the story. I don't want it to make it look like I was a superhero or something. Cause I told people later, they said, Oh, wow, you were really courageous. I said, remember, I watched the guy getting beaten up to a point. Mm -hmm. It was only at a certain point. I said, this is now murder. Hmm. At this point, I got to get out of here. Yeah. 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 Well, there's, there's, there was a lot of richness. There's a lot of richness in, in, uh, in being able to be transparent, being able mm -hmm. to, to talk about stuff. Now there's a, the other part of it is this, if you can't get real transparent about your life and there's a lot of stuff going on, you probably ought to get out of the pulpit. You probably ought to get, get out of that position for a minute and, and get yourself patched up and mm -hmm. have those conversations with somebody else privately, get your, get your soul healed up and then, right. and then make your way back to where you need to be. Like let, but don't do it. It's a totally different place when you get back. That's right. That's right too. And you right. may just say, I can't preach like this anymore. That's right. You know, I've moved into a new dimension. It's a, uh, it's just part of the, the beauty of, I guess, aging that God gives us that ability. That's just right. like the body slows down. I can't, you know, run anymore or yep. whatever. I yep. can't lift that much weight. And I think in preaching too, it's like, that was for a different time. Sure enough. Sure enough. And yeah, you're right. Yeah. you get, the, the, the transparency, uh, I, people want to hear something about us. Yeah. They want to believe that we believe. Yeah, sure enough. Sure enough, you know, and they need they need and they they want evidence of that, and the evidence is one's experience. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. On the other hand, sometimes you know we need to totally drop that and just catechize people. Yeah, uh, it's sort of like uh, there was a problem in uh, a lot of Catholic hymns that we noticed since the seventies. They moved away from hymns about God into hymns about us, and. Uh, in the Beatles' last released album, Let It Be, there's a song called I, Me, Mine. I think oh, George Harrison yeah. wrote it. I, me, me, mine. And we started noticing how often those words were in Christian hymns. I, me, mine. So it becomes anthropocentric. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I'm going to do this. And Lord, I'm going to do this. And I'm going to give my life away. And it was like, you know, it's so based on you that if you crumble, your faith is over. Yeah. I mean, you're putting this... Uh, what do we call Pelagian, you know, where I'm going to earn my salvation. I can do it. It's like, we need to be singing about that, which is like mm -hmm. angels, mm -hmm. heaven, saints, God's glory, things that kind of like are not about us yet. We're, yeah. we're, we're connected to, but we're not focusing. Just talk mm -hmm. about that, which, which is, and the same thing with preaching. Sometimes you got to take yourself totally out of it and say, I'm just going to preach to you about angels today. Yeah. yeah. And what we point. believe about angels and, uh, and I'm not going to tell you a personal angel story. I'm just going to talk right, about angels right. or I'm going to talk about judgment day Yeah. or what was lost in the garden of Eden. That's like my favorite thing to, I don't know if it's preaching, but to catechize people on hmm. and to say, I just want you all to imagine there you go. what we lost. When you start understanding what we lost, you'll start looking around and saying, well, then we got to move on to get this stuff back. Hmm. It's like, Exactly. Yeah. And you're not going to get it back here. So you see the effects of sin, you know, and it's like, and I don't have to mention any of my personal stories or anybody's stories. Yeah. I'm just going to help you to understand that what we teach. And so sometimes you got to get away from yourself. Totally. Yeah. I've got a, um, I've got a really good friend. He and I developed a program and he, he, currently he has grabbed, he's taking this thing by the reins and, and he's developing a, developing an app, like a, like a, like a smartphone app for mm -hmm. this, for this very, this very concept. And uh, are you familiar with, are you familiar with the name Ravi Zacharias? Yes. Uh huh. <laughs> okay. So it wasn't, it was, I don't know, a year, year ago. Oh, just, just over a year ago, year and a half ago, he had passed away. And when he had passed uh, there had been some allegations about him uh, and I mean, you're talking about this guy is this guy, as far as the defense of Christianity has done loads mm -hmm. of, I mean, loads of work and well-known and, and, but after he died, there was some, 
there were some documents that came out and some investigations that came out. And I mean, they just, he'd been tied up into a lot of just uh, a lot of pretty, pretty vile stuff. And um, I called him, uh, I called my buddy on the phone one night late uh, after I'd read the, after I'd read the document. And I was just like, good gosh. Cause Ravi Zacharias is one of those guys. Like you want to know like how humble of a guy, how, how, um, how, how sweet natured of a guy that the Mormon tabernacle called him and had him come preach at the Mormon tabernacle, yeah. you know? And it's like, how did, like, how does that happen? You know, like that's a, that's just a wild. And so he goes and he, and he preaches and it was just excellent. I mean, just, I call him on the phone after I'd read this, read this, these articles. And I said, listen, I said, if Ravi Zacharias can't keep his freaking wheels between the lines on the highway, what chance in the world do you and I have of keeping our freaking selves between the lines? If Ravi Zacharias cannot keep it between the lines, how, how are we? What did your friend say? He said, man, I don't have. Or what did you guys arrive at? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he says, I don't have, he said, I, he said, I don't have any idea. And I said, listen, here's what I think. I think if any, if Ravi Zacharias would have had anybody in his life who would be willing to tell him the truth at any point, if he would have just, if, if Ravi would have been able to keep one person in his life who would just tell him the truth all the time. I don't think he would have ever messed it up. I said, so here's what I think from this point forward, from this point forward, me and you will spend 90 seconds a day telling the most honest things we can say about ourselves to Mm -hmm. one another. And we're going to do this for 30 straight days, 90 seconds every single day. So I'm going to take 90 seconds and I'm going to call you on the phone in the morning. And here's what I'm going to say, Sergio, I just want to tell you something. Uh, woke up this morning, feeling a little insecure about this. I got a big appointment uh, this afternoon. I got a meeting this evening. It's uh, I feel pretty intimidated by it. I got some. I got an elders meeting this evening. I'm not looking forward to that. Uh, my wife and I got an argument yesterday, and and that sucks. And I'm having some older. I'm having some trouble with my oldest daughter, and uh, I just need to get all that stuff processed out of my head and put outside, just outside, so that I can operate. I'm not carrying this around with me all the time. And he said, man, he said, and I said, is our ministry worth 90 seconds a day? Could we spare 90 seconds a day? Yeah. Is your yeah. marriage worth 90 seconds a day? Yeah. Is your Even job- if you don't have to comment on each of those. That's exactly right. There's no comment. Because There's- because then, then you're just putting more into my head and it's just like, just wanted to say it. What do you that's got right. to say? That's right. And Unless so that's did. what we did. We did it for, we did it for, we did it for 30 days. And here's what's crazy. Uh, it was the most productive 30 days that he, and both of us came back and said, dude, has this been the most productive 30 days that you've had in how long? And he said, probably in years, in years, mm-hmm. the most productive, because if you can make yourself get rid of the garbage that is just resting in your head and just put it outside of you, and you know that you've put it in a safe place. And it's not that I need you to comment. I don't need you to fix it. I just need to know that I can put it out there and I can hear it is it changing something? Listen, it worked so well that we've repeated this process with other people. And the other day, I kid you not, the other day I got a phone call and a guy was calling me from another church in another County, about 70 miles away. And he says, Hey, Jared, I want to call and talk to you and ask if you would come and speak to our high school kids about this and this and this. And I said, sure. And I said, just so you know, I want to tell you, this will be my approach. My approach will be this program that me and a buddy have kind of put together. And it's, it's, it, it works like this. And I tell him about it and he goes, Oh yeah. Is your friend named Sergio? And I said, yeah, it is. And he says, uh, well, I have a friend who knows a friend of his, who he had learned about this program from them. And Uh actually me and my friend have been doing that. I didn't realize that it, you guys were the ones that had come up with this. We've been doing 90 seconds a day for the last 30 days. And so like, it, like, this is incredible. And I'm like, Oh, like, so the first time it came full circle and landed back in our, in our lap. And so like, that's been so instrumental for us. And I think it goes back to what you're talking about with the self-disclosure in the preaching. If you can get rid of some of that stuff and you can put it in a safe place, Mm -hmm. I can now make room in my heart and in my head 
for me to take the gospel message and let it do what it needs to do. Confess your sins to one another so that you may be healed. Well, there you may know. be some ministers who haven't had a natural experience of that. Mm. So it's almost like it has to be taught. I mean, the natural experience is, is your childhood best friend. If you if, right. if you have a childhood best friend, that's what you were doing every day anyway with him. That's exactly right. 100%. Uh, and we, we, we do that. I, I would imagine once you get married, you know, your wife becomes that person. But then outside of that relationship, you start finding, I still need that other right. uh, friend not that, uh, not to the exclusion of my wife, right? but uh, just someone else who is a friend that uh, I can lay that out on. Mm-hmm. I know the priests are working on stuff like that. There's a program called Exodus 90. I think mm. it's a Catholic program, but it's 90 days. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that goes with it, uh, like cold showers, no warm showers, no music, no meat. I love uh, it. It's a tough one. Uh but it it can't be done unless you have a I don't know what they call it, a prayer partner or it has to be done in a group. Perfect. You're not supposed to do it alone. There has to be somebody else you can check in with. So yeah, Exodus ninety it works on that. Too. Can I find? I that? haven't done it. Some of the guys in my parish wanted to do it a year or so ago, and they told me about it. I said, well, when does it start? And they said tomorrow. I said, well, <laughs> wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. Definitely the cold shower thing is the thing that freaks almost every guy out. Like. You tell me no hot water when I get in that shower. And they're like, not for 90 days. Okay. And a lot of guys want to do it the 90 days before Easter. Right. Well, that's right. the coldest part of the year. That's you know, right. can we please do this in July. All right. Well, yeah. check this out. This is good. This is great. And this is why, this is why uh, I think it's important. I think it's important that we stay in contact because there's way too many of these conversations that, that overlap. So mm-hmm. me and me and uh, me and a lot of my, my buddies, we've, we've started doing, we started doing this a few years ago. We started doing ice baths um, on the regular. And so like, so it's like right now outside today, I don't know what the temperature is today, um, but it's, it's probably 30, probably 30 degrees here. And so um, the ice, I have a horse trough that sets out back on my back patio, it's full Uh of water. And so got a sledgehammer. And so when I'm done with my workouts in the morning, we bust ice and then get in the ice bath two to four minutes every day. No, no, no. Two to four minutes every single day. So there's a couple of things that happen. Number one, um, it gets rid of inflammation. Like, so if you've worked out and you're going to be sore or you've, you've, you've done some running and, and, and your legs are tight, it, it, it pushes the inflammation out of your body. So that's, that's, an, that's one of the things that's really good. Number two is really good for you mentally because you're forcing yourself to have to sit in something that's really uncomfortable and build up a little mental resilience. It's also good for oxygenation. So if you mm. can get yourself to start breathing deep and the last one, this is the, this is the, by far my favorite one. Secret to COVID. That's right. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. But my favorite one is this. It's, um, it's supposed to increase your dopamine levels by like 540%. So when you begin to think about oh, the, ki- the, the kind of things that we wrestle with when people get into ministry, that depression is a pretty common idea. So the idea of taking cold showers, if you can understand some of the science behind, and there's a lot of good science, you understand some of the science behind some of this. It's like, what are we really trying to do? Well, we're trying to kind of tamp down maybe the, maybe the physical urge that we have as men. Maybe that's part of it. It's like, maybe that's not the only thing. Maybe the other thing we're doing is we're bumping the dopamine up a little bit to where now I'm not connecting this with something that I'm missing out on. I'm connecting this to something that's not giving me something. It's granting me something and it's taking me to another place. And I remember after the movie Titanic came out, I think it was maybe around 1999 or something. I was actually in the monastery, the seminary, starting to be a priest. The next morning I said, I'm going to take a cold shower because like when the water was coming in and they're running down the halls, I said, you know, that was the only thing. They didn't look like they were shivering too much, just running into it waist high. Right. That's ice water. As I said, let me see what that's like if you, you know, ended up in the ocean. And I'm sitting there, you know, in the cold shower going, I can't take this. I mean, and you think about that fear that other people had or whatever, or, or uh, reading about guy, uh, guys in the Russian Soviet gulags uh-huh, up in Siberia. Uh-huh. Yeah. And uh, some of the ways they used to kill people. I, I read a story about how they killed some Orthodox Russian Orthodox priests you know, on a freezing night, the guards sprayed water on them or threw buckets of water on them until they just turned into ice mm. statues and died. And sometimes, you know, uh, when, when I've done that, I've tried, you realize how painful it is. I mean, you're yeah. probably in that trough just going, mm, 
yeah, but if right. you realize this is how you're going to die yeah and you think like could i do this i was uh i was at a, a club and sitting in the sauna you know with some other guys and i was like what if they locked this door and said they're only going to let us out if we say that <laughs> jesus christ is not god well no i just stay in here and then we're like okay pretend it's locked and you're starting to sweat and you're like okay would you get out well could we say it but not mean it and I'm like, well, then you can't evangelize the, the guard, you know? Oh, man. Uh, would Jesus forgive us? And you're starting to get desperate and sort of like, would you do it? And it's like, That's I don't funny. know. Yeah. I don't know. But you would say, God, I hope I could just say I'm not going to say I it. Hold on. Yeah. Hope yeah. I can hold on. You know, because I got to live excellent. with myself after this or whatever. And, you know, so sometimes <laughs> just mentally, you know, taking an experience like that and saying, could I be a martyr? You know, yeah. it's this mini martyrdom almost. Right. Yeah. Right. So you could do Exodus 90. I, I don't know. I, I, I need to look it over. Can I find it online? Can I find some something yeah, about you it? You just type in Exodus 90 okay. and okay. There's, there'll be a group in your area doing it. Really? And uh, I, again, I, since I haven't done it, I can't tell you all about it. I just know a bunch of the men in my parish did it. And some of them say, I continue to not do this. I mean, it's extreme. They're like, no more music. 90 days. Don't listen to music. Not your car. You drive to your work. If you're, if you have to drive to work in dead silence, you know, uh, wow. I think they completely have to unplug from the internet or, or at least you can only use it for work. And, uh, which is wow. great. Wow. But, uh, That's excellent. It's excellent. Ouch. So we're, you know, we're then, serious back deprivation. Let me, let, uh, it, there might be a link with that in preaching that sometimes in preaching, we might end up wanting to tell people what to do. Mm. And I don't like doing that, like telling people you ought to do this. Uh, I'm sure we can make suggestions or tell people what's out there and stuff. But I know we want to be careful of telling people like y'all ought to take a shower, you know, like that. Oh, or, yeah, sure. Unless you're just saying, let's try it for fun as a congregation mm -hmm. or right. something. Right. But uh, yeah, we want to be careful about, you know, like t telling people too much of like what they should do, what they should do, what they should do. I'm like. I don't know. Let the Holy Spirit tell you what to do. But yeah, uh, yeah, like we're not up there to, you know, when we do have to preach things about morality or, you know, developing a more spiritual life. I don't know. I'm a little reticent about, about, you know, give, give, give it being a life coach. Yeah. 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 Cause I'm yeah. like, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know because you can probably find out things that are better than I can imagine. Yeah. So that's excellent. Well, hey, let me, question. let me. What else you got? I got one right here. What encouragement? What encouragement can you offer to other preachers in and other priests who may find themselves in in a uh, in a stagnant state, um, yeah. overwhelmed, uh, yeah. beat down by by either the by either. He's not the talking about me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, those guys that just they found themselves. They're worn out. They're they're just busted yeah. up. Well, I have to admit, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm at a pace right now where that, that means more to me, hmm. you know, years ago, I would have said, yeah, uh, a guy that's having problems and stuff. And it's like, now it's like, no, I've, I've tasted that. Mm -hmm. uh, hey, uh, one thing is, uh, I think sometimes we, we have to admit sometimes when we can't do things hmm. and I don't think we should keep plugging away sometimes when that's not what we should be plugging away at. That if someone's hitting burnout, and maybe it is a, a call to say, I gotta, I gotta go another direction here. You know, it's almost like, like for a priest, I might have to say, Bishop, how can I help you? I mean, you've got me in charge of this parish. I run this parish and, but I can't do that anymore. How can I help you? I've just, I have to admit, I, I might be done with that. And that's okay for us to say that, that maybe, maybe as far as this goes, you know, I've run my race. I'm not so sure that a minister has to necessarily say, I got to make it all the way to the grave being a minister. Yeah. Uh, there could be times where it's like, <laughs> you needed this for now mm -hmm. and stuff, or it needs to change. And maybe change drastically in some way. So, you know, just to, because I don't know, because it can be overwhelming thinking like, I got to get back on that horse. And then you realize, you know, that that horse is so high. And it's like, well, you're going to, you're just going to hurt yourself. Yeah. 
I guess that's why we do have like, you know, their treatment programs and such. Uh, you know, we reach out to friends and stuff, but if we can't get back up there, uh, yes, we have to find another way to do it. <laughs> what do you think? Oh, man. Yeah. I mean, listen, here's what I think. I think. I mean, I know it's weird because a priest pledges himself for life. And I'm not saying that a priest should leave, but you have to alter your ministry perhaps at some point. Mm -hmm. Now, I know, you know, without making a lifetime vow, if a, you know, a Protestant evangelical minister, yeah, maybe he could just say, you know, you know lots of, important. lots of them do lots of them, lots of them just, they just step away. And I, I think sometimes that's, I think sometimes that's one of the best things they can do. You know, they can mm -hmm. step away from it and go, you know, it's, it's, like I'm, I'm undone. Like I'm undone. I, I, I got myself crossed up and, and I need, I need help and I need out. But, mm -hmm. but let me tell you this, let me tell you this uh, conversations like these with a, with a kindred spirit, like these go a long freaking way. If we would be brave enough to have them. You yeah. Know? It's conversations like they go a long way, but there's got to be an element. There's got, you got to stop being the, I know guy. And yeah. you have to, you have to start becoming the guy that can, you know, think about, you know, think about Jesus words, take my yoke upon you, you know, for I'm gentle, for I'm easy, for I'm, I'm humble at heart. Like this idea of like, he, like if you're experiencing ministry and it doesn't feel like the yoke is easy and it doesn't feel like there's, you're not feeling that presence, that simple presence and that simple power, that, that meekness of, like he's with you and it's okay. And yes, it's heavy. And yes, we're going to stumble through a little bit and that's okay. But listen, we're okay. And it's not this taskmaster Jesus in the, in the wagon behind cracking a whip over, right. your, over your back. You know, like if well, you, we make it, we put the pressure on ourselves. Like I have to accomplish this thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, God, maybe, yeah. maybe there's a little bit of, of needing to address, needing to address that. Like, who are you working for? Like, who, who is it that you're working? Did you make a vow to like go be successful or just to go be available or to go be his? I'll take right now, Jared. I was sent to Buckeye, Arizona in, in 2000. It was a town of like 5,000 people, maybe three or yeah. five. You can look it up. Then in 2006, the bishop asked me to go there. And that's the way it works in the church. A bishop will ask a priest, can you go somewhere? And I'm like, initially, I didn't want to anyway. I ended up there. 30,000. It's 100,000 people now. But the main thing, as he said, is the church is about the size of a double wide trailer. And the church, the town now has 100,000 people in it. Mm. Easily 20% to 30% of the people are baptized Catholics. So I, I easily probably have 15,000 people that would identify as Catholic. And I, so I've got to build this church. And I have built a hall and a chapel and we've been blessed. But now it's time to make the big move and get this $10 million building. Catholic churches are not cheap. You can't make them for less than 8 million. Right. And then there's the process. And you know, you're going to cut that ribbon and say, I'm so disappointed. This doesn't look right. Mm -hmm. I'm mm -hmm. disappointed with that. Sure. Or, sure. you know, so-and-so ripped me off or mm -hmm. the wrong time to build. In you fact, we find it. that a lot, of, a lot of ministers after they cut that ribbon within one year, ask for a transfer. Yeah. They completely leave the ministry mm. because it's just like, I'm done with it. You know? I called the, when I built the chapel and the, uh, our plaza and our, our new center anyway, where we have mass, but it's just a hall and it looks a bit like a hall. Uh, I called it like my satanic year because I was into like, you know, paperwork and uh, talking to city people and this and arguing about that. And I'm like, oh, this is not what I want to do, but I got to yeah. get this done. Well, now I need to get this church done and I think I can get it done in the next three years, perhaps. What is it? 22? In, in three and a half years, I think I can get it done, four years at the most. But I have to be honest and say, do I need to do that? I'm not going to be judged that I built this big, beautiful church that can hold all the Catholics in Buckeye. I can pass the baton to somebody else, but should I? And just because right now maybe I'm a little frustrated or burned out or something, you know, is that enough reason to say I'm not going to finish it? But if I don't have what it takes to do it, I mean, I don't want to go through this. This will be bad for the people. Yeah. And I'm going to cut that ribbon and quit. Mm -hmm. So I'm having to be honest right now and say, I got to be honest here. I only got about six months before we're the cogs are in motion. Mm 
Yeah. And that would be really bad for the people for me to start it and not finish. I think there's yeah. some a parable in the Bible about that. Yeah, 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 there is. Right? Yeah, sure enough. So you have to be honest and say, Lord, you know, it, you want me to do this. I mean, I guess I would like to do it. There's nothing personal in it. I don't really feel like, oh, wow, I built a great, beautiful church. Everybody will remember me. That really means nothing to me. But it would be negligence not to do it for these poor people. They need it. So yeah. if I don't do it, somebody's got to do it. So why not me? But I have to say, should I? It's okay if I were to say, I don't have the energy, guys. After 16 years with you, trying to get this campus completed, when it came to the, I hit the wall at the last two miles of the marathon, hmm. I, I have to pass the baton. I, I, I'm getting myself willing to do that. Because to do otherwise could be disastrous, to think like, I have to do this. No, yeah. I don't have to do it. Yeah. So... Because I have to admit, you know, like recently, a lot of what I've been doing has been checking boxes. Yeah. You know, you got to do this, check, got to do this, check. And I'm like, I'm just checking boxes. Yeah. I'm not doing things, you know, and you mm -hmm. go in and out of that with ministry. The other thing I maybe I'd to answer your question, if someone's going through something, those are definitely the times we learn the most. Mm -hmm. That dark tunnel is, is where the learning takes place. Mm -hmm. And so contrary to what I said about, you know, like maybe saying, maybe this is the end. You also want to think getting through this is going to give me so much strength and godly power. Yeah. So yeah. I'm going to let myself go through this depression, through this uh, anxiety. Yeah. I need yeah. to learn things. I need to get broken down. <laughs> It'll make me more compassionate. Mm. And, and then you become another person when you come out of that tunnel back into the light and you're like, whoo. Yeah. Dang, that was worth going through. Yeah, sure enough. Sure enough. So I, I, I would keep that in mind that mm -hmm. there's there's great uh, great riches, you know, mm -hmm. up ahead with, without thinking that on the same time, on the same hand, I guess, like you have to do it. Yeah. No, I think that's good advice. Uh. I think that's good advice. Well, let me tell you this. I was having a conversation with my oldest daughter. Maybe it was both of them. I can't remember if the youngest one was in there, but we were talking about how there is like, we are, we are distinct in the way that we are made and that you have a, a certain set of skills and personality. And I said, and here's the thing where, where so many people in the world go wrong is they never, they never have the Holy spirit come into their life so that all the best parts can be activated. Because when the Holy Spirit moves into a person mm -hmm. and their personality is then activated by that, and then these other just colorful things, I mean, it's like a prism. It's like when it hits it and then it just throws these colors across everywhere and it just scatters and it rains and drips and pours and gleams off of all the surrounding walls and the people around. And like, that's the important part. And, and, you said something earlier where, where, where you talked about, you know, the, 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 the priest, it's almost like we want his personality to be, or there's at least a conversation about the priest personality might need to be mashed down a little bit. And, and I can tell you this, I can tell you this from, from the couple of conversations we've had. Um, I am so, I'm so happy to have been able to meet you and to have conversations with you because one of the things that is it's so apparent to me and 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 apparent to me from reading the comments of the video that went around was this is what I kept hearing. I didn't hear things like I didn't read things like, oh yeah, he obliterated Biden. Here's yeah. what I kept reading. Every once in a while there would be one that would pop in there and it would go, ah, oh, I love Father Billy. Oh, mm -hmm. I love Father Billy. Oh, I love Father Billy. And here's what I know. Those are people who know you. Yeah. And your personality activated by the presence of the Holy Spirit is leaving a massive impact on the people in Buckeye. And I want you to know, I appreciate you a bunch. And I'm going to count you as a friend of mine, whether you enjoy that or appreciate that or not. I'm going to go ahead and just refer to you from this point forward as my friend. Thanks, uh, Jared. My friend, Father William uh, Costco in Buckeye. Arizona. So thank you so much for this time. Thank you so much for uh, coming on the podcast. I appreciate it a bunch. Thanks for your time today. And by the way, we are at one hour and 51 minutes. Oh, wow. Well, we got nine more minutes. <laughs>
<laughs> uh, so good. So oh, good. Yeah, there's so much more we could keep talking about. I know. I know. We need to uh we need to do this uh, we need to do this again sometime. I think there's plenty yeah. to talk about. And yeah, I would I love to visit you. I would love to visit after you've read some Fred Craddock. Okay. And after you've been able to point me toward uh some guys that have been an influence on you and I would love for us to have a conversation about that. As far as influence, uh if you know St. Ignatius of Loyola, Spain, 1500s just to know his story because uh, he's big on imagination. Hmm. Okay. You know, uh, you don't, I don't know if you, if you don't know his story at all, he just, I don't. he was a, a rich uh, young man. And back then a lot of these uh, towns would fight with other towns or different, you know, areas would fight and stuff. And he got a, a cannonball through his leg and he went home to recuperate for a year and he wanted something to read, you know, while he sat in bed. And basically what he wanted was like Harlequin romances or what you almost might call their version of our porn or whatever, whatever you could get, you know, stories of knights and girls and stuff, you know, to pass the time. And then they gave him the Bible and the life of saints. And he noticed something. He noticed when he read these adventure stories and these salacious stuff that it excited him and kept him occupied. But when he was done, he would just feel enervated, like sapped of energy. But then when he would read these stories about Jesus, uh, the Bible, uh, the Gospels, and the lives of saints, after he'd close it, he felt a surge of energy. And so he said, he developed this idea of the discernment of spirits that, you know, you may enjoy this, but eventually pulls you down. And he, and he just started using his imagination to think a lot about, what if I could really be a saint? What if I could walk away from all this and just... You know, and he just found that imagine. And so he developed some exercises of using your imagination. Uh, today, there's what they call the 30 day Ignatian retreat. It's a really? silent retreat. And uh, and you go through different parts of the life of Christ and you use your imagination to see him, to visualize him and to see if you can hear him speaking to you. So I've always liked that idea of using your imagination Uh and I always hope I don't go outside the boundaries when I use my imagination when I talk about things with people. Because mm -hmm. uh, sometimes people are saying, are you saying that that's the way it is? And I'm like, no, I'm just using my imagination. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Like imagine if Adam and Eve had never sinned. Yeah. Can you imagine the way it would be now? Right. I mean, think about certain things. Right. You know? Like, would we be able to go to the moon? Because as sinners, we were able to go. Hmm. But if we weren't sinners, how would we go? We wouldn't have to go in a rocket ship because those could blow up. That would mean death. Right. Well, death is a result of sin. If there's no sin, how would we get to the moon? I'm like, think about it. It'd be like, I dream a genie. To the moon. It's like, are you saying that's the way it would be? I'm like, could be. Yeah. I mean, it's worth thinking about. And then you think about, my God, we would have had those powers. It's like, yeah, we lost them. Mm -hmm. Or a virus. Maybe a virus actually is something that, triggers something that, 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 that's part of God's plan, but because of sin, it's all screwed up. Huh. Like, it's not our enemy, but use your imagination because otherwise God created evil things to bother you. No, he didn't. Right. So I, I get that a bit from Ignatius, maybe a little bit, that idea of using your imagination and stuff. Yeah. You know, along those, along the, that, that same idea, um, a thought that I've been working on, and, and this is kind of what, this is kind of what happened with, uh, when I was telling you the Leviticus 10 verse um, over the last, Oh, probably the course of the last two months, I've been thinking about um, the idea that a creative energy, like, a bit, like thinking of my life in terms of creative energy, that there's like, that like God gives you a certain amount of creative energy. And then sometimes what happens is you get, you get bogged down in, in, um, in meetings, you get bogged down in, in, in having to get through the garbage and the and the the small the the the, the small writing at the bottom, and you got to yeah. you got to just and it's just this just the tedious, monotonous details of that are just so mundane and sterile. Yeah. It just seems like it just saps everything out of you. And then sometimes even what happens is you can get so far into your head with resentment or anger yeah. or unforgiveness that it begins to just 
chew away at your creative energy and it begins to go further and further away. And I think the same thing is true of porn. Like when you were talking about with Ignatius, that, that idea that you can begin to fantasize and you can get yourself so involved in some narrative in your head. that One of the things that can happen is that you can begin to, um, put your creative energy away and, and or, or burn it off in places it doesn't need to be. And so yeah. then this is something that popped into my mind as I was thinking about that Leviticus 10 passage. You know, the problem with unauthorized fire is it's taking up resources that don't belong to you, that you're burning up resources yeah. that are not your resources. These are God-given yeah. resources and it's unauthorized fire. So how much of our life do we do we begin to burn this begin to burn this creative energy that he gives us and it's unauthorized fire because we're over here burning it up in these areas yeah. that we're not supposed to anyway so it just connect or it's for a different time and place there you go yeah that yeah. it's uh like I often think of like you know Adam and Eve reaching for you know the the fruit of knowledge of good and evil maybe god was going to reveal to them things but not at that time right. like a child you know telling your child about how babies are made and stuff mm-hmm. hey when they're five and six, you ain't going to talk about that. That's right. Maybe yeah. when they're 15, 16 or something. So That's there's right. a time and a place. Yeah. So maybe that unauthorized fire, it's like, no, we do this. That's we don't right. need to do it now. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so, yeah, you're burning it out in the wrong place. So it's not, it's not, it's not having it's any efficacy. Mm-hmm. And so again, you're just burning yourself out. Hey, there you go. You're burning out. Yeah, you're burning out. There you go. Yeah. This, it's amazing. Sometimes the sermons just preach themselves, don't they? <laughs> oh, that's great. oh father william costco this is awesome man thank you so much for doing this i appreciate you a bunch yeah let's stay in touch uh yeah. and uh, if i get out your ways oh man i wish you would i wish you would listen i'll take you to a couple of really cool places there's a couple catholic churches here locally that that are uh one is so uh, one is just it's so beautiful because of the landscape around it and it's yeah. ju- just just it's just perfectly built it's perfect we're jealous built. of some of those ones like in kansas where you just I, I, I go by some in like Pennsylvania where my dad's from. And I'm like, man, I would love to be a priest here. Just man. the guy who's here in the neighborhood, in, yeah. the, in the little yeah. town. Yeah. That's all yeah. I want. There's another one up there. There's another one up the road in the whole, and it's, it's an entire thing. And it's built out of the, it's built out of the rock from mm. like the local rock, like the native yeah. stone from, yeah. and it, it's, it's incredible. I mean, it's, a, I mean, I say it's a native stone. I mean, maybe, maybe they hold it in, but it's. Yeah, no, probably it's, it's, we're Perfect. jealous of those out here. We got stucco, you know. Yeah, and yeah. You guys, are good. you guys are good at stucco. That's true. And, and still, it's eight million bucks, you know. Good gracious. Good yeah. gracious. All right. Listen, hey, I'll uh, hold you up. Blessings on all the work you do and anybody, uh, you know, that you work with or interview yeah. and stuff. It's it's neat uh, that we can talk as we share this, you know, we're, we're sharing the same work Yeah. at a really weird time. In really history. weird time. Really yeah. weird time. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost weird that we believe. Yeah. True. I, that was the biggest thing in seminary guys sitting around. Cause most of us were late twenties, early thirties saying, what are we doing here? <laughs> How the heck did we end up here. That's right. And, and, and especially as Catholics, we're agreeing to be celibate for this. Yeah. And right. it, of course for me, it was like, I always wanted to live an adventurous life and do something different. So the celibacy thing was like, yeah, that makes sense to me. Hmm. It makes you look, you know, wow. it's different. But to sit around and ask guys, how is it that we came here? And that was so helpful too. Really? To, to listen to all the stories about how the heck are we here? So even like you and me and you know, your you know, minister friends, my minister friends, it's yeah, it's great to to have those uh, relationships, whether they're good friends or that you minister with, or just like you and me, miles away, know we're doing work for the Lord. Yeah. You know, somehow we ended up here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, this, this, this is cool. This is cool. And I, I love what you do. And, and, uh, um, and I, I'm, I'm just, I'm just very appreciative, very appreciative. And I'm also very humbled. And, and, and I'll be honest, there'll be a lot of Protestant guys. There'll be a lot of Protestant preachers who will turn on this podcast and they'll hear about the first 15 or 20 minutes. And if they're not convicted, they need to go check themselves. They need to go check themselves. And, and if they don't use it any way you can cut it up. No, I'm not. I'm not changing a thing. I'll leave it just like it is. And uh, that's, that's, that's good. I mean, there's some things in there. Like, listen, here's the deal as Protestants. Sometimes we get, we get a little, we get to gloating sometimes and, and uh, running a good Catholic joke, running a good Catholic joke 
isn't isn't too far off, you know, from, from how we operate sometimes. But conversations like this are helpful because, like you said, some really convicting things for me, and and that's uh and that's good. That's good. So, Thanks. listen, well, we got a lot to learn from uh, you know uh, other Christian ministers, and particularly with regard to preaching, because some of our best preachers in the Catholic Church are are Protestant ministers who became Catholic. They mm-hmm. get it you know, and who have taught us, you know, if they're, if they're not ministers, if they're not priests, if they don't become priests, some of our best professors are Protestant ministers really? uh, who, uh, who are just helping us to understand what we have, that we don't even understand some of it and to refresh us in scripture. Some of the, right. the biggest movements in America in scripture is coming from uh, Protestant converts to Catholicism. Wow. So they're bringing with them just something to awaken us up. I mean, wow. priests go to conferences to listen to them, huh. you know, telling them how to preach, you know, because they used to preach to congregations. And wow. so we're benefiting greatly from, you know, the resources, the knowledge you guys have. That's awesome. That's awesome. All right, man. I appreciate you a bunch. Two hours and two minutes. We nailed it. Peace. Thank you. I'll talk to you later on. <laughs>